Yes, we didn't know about them before the rest of the council. We found one of them. It had crashed on one of our more remote colonies. The primary crater was nearly 100 metres in diameter. At the centre were the remains of a craft, believed to be originally more than 30 metres in length. Our initial scans and metallurgical analysis showed likelihood that an unknown form of energy weapon was used against the craft, which did more damage before the heat of re-entry. It, we would later be informed, that it was a male of the species, was taken unresponsive from where it landed, and looked over by some of our top medical minds. They all agreed that the subject was brain dead. There was near to no electrical activity in the subject's cranial limb. This, plus heavy damage to the primary torso and the need for external stimulation of circulatory organs, caused all experts to agree that the subject was dead. He was pronounced as such, though his body was kept on support systems for study. The subject itself was found in center of a secondary impact crater some 15 kilometers from the primary crater, and was more than 10 meters in diameter. The crater shows signs of extreme heat and impact with glassing and fracturing of the substrata, at centre was a mass of what is believed to be some form of battle armour. Found encased in a shell of metallic and ceramic materials, this armour was removed with great care to not harm the body. No simple task as muck of the material had slacked during re-entry. Plasma cutting torches were employed for the outer layers. The second layer was a silicone based material that had hardened with the heat turning from a flexible antikinetic suit into a protective shell. Under this layer was a semi-solid solution that upon further chemical analysis and examination of a few intact sections, was determined to have been a polymer that mimicked natural muscle structure. In essence, the armour was also a full body prosthesis that likely increased the subject's strength anywhere from 60 to 120%. It is also determined that the armour was designed to allow its wearer to survive re-entry combat capable. In this case, a direct hit with an unknown weapon caused much of the outer layers to become damaged, even so, the secondary layers also seem to have been designed to sacrifice themselves to protect the occupant even from re-entry. This multiple redundancy shows a level of paranoia or militant thinking that does not bode well for future encounters with this species. It was then that members of our military staff made it clear that they deemed it best if they take direct control of access to the subject for security reasons. This was agreed. Additionally, a cursory on site examination showed that the subject possessed multiple inorganic implants including the surgical implantation of an interface and communications device. The subject was taken to one of our most secret and secure military facilities, where further tests on chemical and biological makeup were conducted. Tissue tests found that rapid cellular regeneration was taking place. The subject's body was regrowing, and furthermore the area most damaged were actually becoming toughened in comparison to the rest of the subject's body. Further tests revealed that there were several layers of this healed damage over all areas of the subject's body, it had been exposed to multiple instances of heavy epidermal and internal organ damage from pyrolosis, bludgeoning impact and evisceration. Each area seemed to have regrown on its own and hardened to become more resistant to further damage. And this level of biological self-repair was of extreme interest to our medical staff. Mapping of internal organs and samples taken of each one showed multiple redundant systems. Cardiac organ was 47% more powerful than it needed to be. Waste filtering and digestion systems showed they were capable of processing almost any organic matter into fuel. Triple redundant filtering organs remove impurities from such as blood and other vital fluids. Close examination, removal was not authorized, or sensory organs showed indication of broad spectrum perception across multiple sources, including but not limited to visual, auditory, olfactory, pressure, heat and taste. Unconfirmed, but likely is electromagnetic sensitivity, and after scans of the nervous system showed several areas with unknown functions that could not be accounted for biologically, it was hypothesized that the subject possessed another sensory type, as yet unknown. Upon completion of body scan, focus was given on what was universally agreed to be the subject's primary neural organ. Scans showed that while most function had ceased, it was an electrical-based neural system that, even being artificially kept alive, was causing electrically sensitive equipment to behave erratically. While in this non-living state, only 4% of the organ was functioning, and assumed to be the section responsible for basic nervous signaling. Further study also showed that even this 4% was operating at a reduced output, meaning that at full capacity, the subject's naturally occurring thinking process would likely short out our more sensitive medical scanners. When the results of several tissue samples taken from numerous unidentified glands and organs came back with results for the first time, the least scientists employed in this project became uncomfortable. These tests show signs of the subjects having been saturated with several highly dangerous, unstable and toxic chemicals. 
Some initially thought it indicated the subject had been a drug user. Further tests yielded that the subject's glands actually produced these substances, and could do so in great quantity if stimulated. At this point, it was generally thought that there had been some mistake, or that the samples had been contaminated. But further samples yielded the same results, and further revealed that this mix of chemicals had likely been a natural part of the subject's biological makeup, and not an artificial addition, as some had supposed. Some noted substances include multiple endorphins, sedatives, stimulants, as well as uh, several known neurotoxins. A full list of the chemicals is too long for this report, but can be provided on request. At this point, we should then return to the subject's many artificial implants. An unidentified neurological interface was surgically implanted on the subject's primary nerve cluster at the base of the cranial limb, and included a microburst, broad-range, multi-spectrum communication device. Secondary devices were found attached to several of the subject's cardiopulmonary organs. Upon close examination with micro-optic cable, it was discovered that these implanted devices increased the subject's ability to filter toxin and pathogens. Another device was found attached to one of the subject's waste filtration organs, presumably enhancing its function, and yet another was found attached to one of the secondary cardiovascular organs. Upon close inspection, it was determined to be a nanite hive. After assessing for biological threats, it was found that the device regularly injects cellular repair nanites into the subject's bloodstream, further reinforcing the subject's already impressive capability to self-repair. Lastly, an unidentified device had been implanted at the base of the brain, and had been linked with almost every section of the subject's cortex, and interlinked with the main neural cluster. It was hypothesized that this was some sort of synaptic acceleration module, but further study would have required removal, as it was too entwined with neural fibers to do so, without total dissection of the subject's neural system, it was deemed unnecessary at the time. The subject was then removed to an armored bunker several stories underground, and was kept attached to the electrocardio stimulation device that was keeping it biologically active, as well as several banks of medical scanners. The only entrance to the subject's room was at the end of an armed hall kept guarded at all times. The incident in question took place three months after the subject had been placed in the facility. Recording systems captured the exact moment, as the electrical activity of the subject's brain intensified nearly 300%. Moments later, this activity expanded and grew, and the subject simply sat up, ignoring the restraints that had been used to hold it in place. The subject then pulled the leaves of the electrocardial device from his torso, leaking some pulmonary fluid as he did so. At this point, some attempts to communicate were made, but the syntax and vocal range were too divergent to make sense of in the short amount of time. The subject moved to the armoured door and began demolishing it with its primary manipulation of energies, and a length of metal taken from one of the stands that held the medical scanners. After defeating that object, the subject was greeted by a squad of soldiers with orders to subdue, but not kill. In retrospect, the subject likely saw being greeted by shockstick armed troops as hostile, which compounded with the armoured door and restraints as attempts to imprison him. But for whatever reason, after exchanging untranslatable words with the unit commander, it simply approached the troops and killed several with unarmed blows. Study of recordings seemed to indicate that the subject was confused at the extreme success of its initial attacks, and as it adjusted its attacks after pausing, it only subdued the rest of the staff, supporting the idea that it had not intended to kill the first few troops. It then ran towards a hangar, where another group had been studying his craft, who had, by this point, actually repaired parts of it, in attempts to better understand its systems. The subject then subdued anyone who resisted even slightly and boarded his craft, inserted a cable from the ship into the port on his neck, and took off, making it through our planetary defence grid, and engaged a warp shunt, which, as you know, is an untraceable FTL drive. Recordings of the subject's attempts to communicate now follow. Upon encountering troops. Hey, where the hell is this? Do you understand me? I guess not. Are they listening to Guard Commander? Fuck me, I do not have the time, patience, or training for this first contact bullshit. Sorry, but this is gonna hurt. After killing, first unit of troops. Shit, what are these guys made of? Jelly or something? Fuck, this had better not go on my record. Upon entering hangar. Hello, beautiful. What the hell have they done to you? This speaker would also like to point out that, as yet, we don't know who or what was able to damage the human craft so badly, it was forced from FDL and down onto our outpost. What's more, it is our opinion that a species is able to interface itself directly to their machines and resist damage, as well as this, should be left to their own devices, or caught it as allies.